Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Chris Peterson. I'm a law professor here at the University of Utah, and I represent the uh, law school's uh, programs committee that um, uh, tries to create a slate of interesting topics to enrich our intellectual community. Um, and it's my honor to get to introduce our guest for today. Uh, but before I do so, I want to uh, give a few thank yous. First off, I want to thank Chris Monty and her events uh, planning team for all their work and coordinating this. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I also I also want to thank Mark Beekhuizen and all of his IT uh, and audiovisual staff that are helping uh, broadcast this. Uh, thank you both, uh, and to folks at home too. There are you know uh, over a hundred people that are coming in online, watching digitally as well. Um, and last, I want to thank um, uh, our, our, our dean Elizabeth Cronk Warner for her leadership at the law school. Um, uh, it, it, oh. It, after uh, Professor Purdy's remarks, we are going to take some questions. And the way we're going to do questions today is, as we often do at the law school, is using the Slido app. Um, uh, feel free to jump on with your cell phones or whatnot and ask a question anytime throughout the, the lecture. And we can also vote and pick which questions you think are most interesting and uh, try to elevate them and give everybody a voice. Uh, well, the, the, uh, this is the 57th annual Weir William H. Leary Lecture. Uh, uh, William Leary was the first dean of the uh, College of Law, and the Leary Lecture, uh, for over half a century, has been the premier academic uh, uh, scholarly lecture for the University of Utah. Um, uh, and we're very honored today uh, to have a, a, a Professor Jedediah Purdy, who is the uh, Raphael Lemkin Professor of Law at Duke Law School. Uh, Professor Purdy is a prolific scholar who teaches and writes about environmental property and constitutional law, as well as legal and political theory. Uh, he's uh, the author of more books than uh, I could count this morning when I was writing this introduction. He tells me it's seven, but I think he's lying if we count um, uh, edited volumes. It's more than that, I think. And, and they include uh, his most recent uh, book, Two Cheers for Politics, Why Democracy is Scared, Flawed, and Our Best Hope. This Land is Our Land, The Struggle for a New Commonwealth, Common Things, Irony, Trust, and Commitment in America Today, uh, and uh, my own personal favorite of his, a tolerable anarchy, rebels, reactionaries, and the making of the uh, of American freedom. His legal scholarship has also appeared in all the premier uh, academic journals in America, the Yale Law Journal, the Harvard Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, uh, and the Duke Law Journal. Um, uh, and he's published essays on uh, topics ranging from uh, uh, Elena uh, Ferrante's novels and socialism to natural disasters and the Green New Deal. Uh, uh, he's written for Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times, the New Yorker, and Democracy Journal. He clerked on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals for Judge uh, Laval, uh, and uh, he is also a, an active member. He's also a, a licensed member of the New York State Bar um, and an editor of the American Prospect. Um, the reason that, that our programs committee invited him to speak today is because we thought of all of every scholar in America that he had the most interesting ideas on the most essential and fundamental challenges that the American legal system is currently facing. In the Hindu and Buddhist tradition, a guru is a religious uh, teacher, a personal religious teacher and a spiritual guide. Of course, Professor Purdy's work is primarily secular, but if I might politely borrow the term, he is, in my view, quite possibly the foremost guru of American political theory. Please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Professor Jed Purdy to Salt Lake City. Oh, thank you so much for that extremely generous introduction. Um, and thanks, thanks to everyone whose work has made it possible for me to be here. I know it's many of you in many different capacities, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, I'm also grateful to be asked just to come back to this spectacularly beautiful, awe-inspiring place where you live. Um, I had the chance to go up City Creek Canyon first thing this morning and composed about 15 minutes of remarks on the local landscape, which I don't think I have time to deliver. But 
Um, I would if I could. Um, I'm really glad to be here. <clears throat> So everyone worries about democracy, though not everyone pauses to say what they mean by it. So a New York Times poll shortly before the last election found that large shares of voters in both parties feared for democracy, though they didn't fear the same things. And in the run-up to the 2020 presidential election, about 90% of voters said that the country would suffer serious damage if the other guy won. They presumably didn't have quite the same worries. Pollsters ask people whether they expect political violence in future elections, and voters respond that they do. Bookstores have been full of titles <clears throat> like How Democracies Die and How Democracy Dies. The field is crowded enough that those are different books. And for many law students, this time of intense and fragmented anxiety, which we can date roughly to 2016, has been the only political climate that you've known as an adult. Now, a lot of this has been a response to very specific events. And in our super fast and social media supercharged time, we hurry to whip up political theory or historical analysis that elaborates our feelings about the headlines, or at least we reward people who do. But I think that we are right to be worried, even if we're not always worried in quite the right ways. Before 2016, we were living in, on the fumes of a few decades when liberal democracy seemed to be the world's only future. Soviet-style socialism collapsed in 1989 to 91, and the peoples of those countries, captive peoples in many cases, seemed to race spontaneously to become what they poignantly called normal countries, like the United States or West Germany. The great contest over how to organize social and economic life seemed to be over, and our side had won, not by force, but by a great upwelling of popular desire to be free and prosperous, to be like us. <clears throat> Other countries, it was supposed, would come to be like us through market-led development. This was the future of a billion people in India, a raft of books argued during that country's economic liberalization in the aughts and early 2010s. It was also thought to be the future of China, the great geopolitical gambit <clears throat> of the the great geopolitical gambit of the early 21st century was the American engineered admission of China into the World Trade Organization on the theory. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was admiring your mountains just before and I put my now with a frog in my throat on the theory that free trade produces a prosperous middle class which in turn both demands and anchors liberal democracy. And no part of this formula now feels simple or reassuring. It's harder to feel confident that we know where world history is going, and it's not so clear that we know what it would mean to become like us, nor that that would be entirely good. So throughout the era that ended in 2016, there was a feeling that democracy was more or less inevitable. It was what people wanted, and anyway, there was nowhere else for history to go but also that democracy was a little bit superfluous because there were not a lot of big collective decisions to make, so there was not all that much at stake in elections. We knew, after all, how to be a normal country, and so we also didn't need to think very hard about what democracy was. It must be whatever we were already doing, more or less. Now we know that we have to think harder about it, and we have to try to learn in a way that does not simply riff off the headlines or reiterate louder than ever what we and our friends already thought. We have to try to learn from events, which remain, means remaining open to being surprised by them. <clears throat> One way to learn is by spotting the tensions or difficulties that events have made visible in what might have seemed to be a smooth democratic fabric. Let me start with this wrinkle, <clears throat> this difficulty. Democracy is always a profoundly unnatural thing. It's always an artificial achievement. <clears throat> this is because its core premise is that when basic questions have to be answered, and the answers will bind all of us, for example, whether there's a national right to abortion or gun ownership, but not in our political system, the existence of God, when there is a decision which we will all be bound by. The democratic premise is that that decision is made by the people who will live with it. 
us. The word democracy combines the Greek demos, people, and kratos, rule, the exercise of political power. And that origin still fits. <clears throat> but, and here's why it has to be artificial. A people is not the sort of thing that in fact makes decisions in any sense that we would normally recognize. 300 million individuals, more or less, don't have a shared mind to make up. So democracy is always in practice an institutional decision procedure, generally an election whose result we treat as the voice of the people, the demos. And of course, an election is an extremely crude way of making a decision. In practice, the ballot and the voter can only say yes or no, him or her. So as students of, of politics have recognized for a long time, when the people are asked to speak, it's especially important who poses the question, how the alternatives are set up. Even if we happily accepted that a majority vote were the decision procedure that best stands in for a decision by the people, it's very tricky to think about what it means to choose candidates democratically or to set a legislative agenda democratically. And precisely because all of this is so artificial, it isn't enough to set up a decision-making machine whose results we can then call democratic. It's not enough to vote, to hold elections. <clears throat> For those decisions to command legitimacy in practice, meaning if people who fiercely opposed the decision and still believe that it was wrong are nonetheless willing to go along with it and treat it as binding on them, there has to be a willingness to identify with the other side that just defeated you. <clears throat> it's a feeling of being in something together and being committed to it. We could call it solidarity or civic sympathy or a kind of patriotism. Although we seldom put it this way, the thought has to be something like, the people have spoken and although I disagreed, I'm part of them, so the decision goes for me too. This will seldom be the only thought we have. We'll keep on talking and writing and marching about how it was the wrong decision but at the end of the day, living under any political system means you don't always get the decision you want, but must go along with the decision that's been made. And in a democracy, that means living with the decision that a majority of other citizens made, even if you hate and fear the result. For a democracy to command this kind of legitimacy, the people who live in it must view one another as being, to put it in a sort of old way, fit to rule them, qualified to rule, worthy to rule, Otherwise, democracy will seem intolerable. <clears throat> the last seven years have revealed stress lines in the ways American democracy addresses each of these tasks, making decisions, posing questions for decisions, and getting ongoing consent to the decisions. In a phrase, how we do democracy. The Constitution has been at the center of how Americans do democracy, and aspects of it in particular that used to be taken for granted have come under new pressure. <clears throat> okay, so I wanna go through these democratic tasks, making decisions, posing decisions, producing legitimacy for decisions. Start with how we make decisions. <clears throat> the simplest version of a decision by the people would be a majority vote of the national electorate. We don't decide anything that way. James Madison called one of the Constitution's signal achievements, quoting, the total exclusion from government of the people in their collective capacity. In the Federalist Papers, he even set that phrase in all caps, like a very excited text message. If there had been an emoji for boxing out direct democracy, he would have used it, since it's only old people like me and James Madison who use emojis anymore. <clears throat> we do decide things by majority, but not by majority of the electorate. The people who choose the president, the, the, excuse me, the people don't choose the president, although they do choose the electoral college electors who fill the White House by a majority vote of, the, um, of their number. The people don't direct, vote directly on legislation or on party control of Congress, but we vote for senators and representatives who settle those questions by majority vote. And although the Constitution claims to take its authority from we the people, the claim of its opening line is that its status as fundamental law depends on its adoption by the sovereign people who will live under it. <clears throat> the, 
The living people definitely do not weigh in on the meaning of its clauses, nor in any direct way on choosing the judges, a majority of whose votes settle, for now, what the Constitution means. Now, for many decades, this arrangement <clears throat> struck most observers as a good enough approximation to democracy. But in the 21st century, something has already happened twice that didn't happen in the previous century, talking about how events have put pressure on the arrangements we took for granted. <clears throat> the loser of the popular vote has entered the White House twice. And this frustration of majority will rankled some partisans when it benefited George W. Bush in 2000 with an assist from the Supreme Court. And it rankled a good deal more when it let Donald Trump overcome a several million vote deficit nationally to win in 2016. I think it's fair to say that it would have meant something nearer to a constitutional crisis if in 2020, a few tens of thousands of votes in key states had enabled Trump to win again despite losing the popular vote by seven million. Similarly with Congress, the Senate's overrepresentation of small states which lets national minorities wield a majority in the upper house, has become much more salient, a topic of regular complaint. And so has the political insulation of the federal courts, especially the Supreme Court. As recently as the beginning of Justice Kavanaugh's nomination not that long ago, the New York Times explained to readers in one of its explainer columns that the court's legitimacy depended on its remaining above and independent of politics. Now the same constitutional structure strikes many more observers, including the same observers at the New York Times, as much more of a controversial device for partisan entrenchment. In other words, all the ways that we use political processes, more or less constitutionally specified, to create governing majorities in the Electoral College, in Congress, on the Supreme Court, have seen their everyday legitimacy come into question for the ways that they depart from what seems to be the will of national majorities. That gap was always there, at least potentially. It's perhaps implied in Madison's phrase about excluding the people in their collective capacity from government. How did it get to be so salient? Partly, familiar point, it's that geographic and demographic partisan polarization have made smaller and more rural and overall whiter places overwhelmingly Republican, which gives the Senate and Electoral College, and through them the Supreme Court, a much more partisan balance than their skews would have seemed to produce in the past. Consider, uh, I'm not trying to score points here, but analytically, consider that Republicans have won just a single presidential popular vote since George W. Bush did it in 1988, but have appointed six of the nine Supreme Court justices. Now, in fairness, that uh, has a lot to do with the contingency of survival and mortality. And it wasn't until Donald Trump appointed three justices that this potential really bit in terms of the court's personnel. Partly, <clears throat> what's driven the new controversy around the gap between our constitutional structures and majoritarianism is that what, Ameri what many Americans mean by democracy has gradually, and I think appropriately, shifted in recent decades towards something like universal ballot access <clears throat> and the equal value of the vote. It's always striking for me as someone who reads old books to see commentators of earlier generations, even progressives with clear anti-racist credentials, refer without qualification to the US as, as a democracy in the Jim Crow era, or even in the era of Jackson. To the extent that democracy was a positive term, for a long time into the modern era, it tended to mean something like the will of the mass of the people would prevail over any ruling elite. Democracy seemed, from this perspective, compatible with extensive disenfranchisement. The electorate itself, like the constitutional offices that it filled through voting, was engineered with nothing like a clear commitment, to equal participation or voice. As our ideal, if not always practice, moves toward universal enfranchisement and the equal value of the vote, it's also more intuitive to say that something has gone wrong when a national majority is persistently thwarted or when votes for, say, senators have different weight in different states. <clears throat> Another way that these institutions have come under pressure has more to do with the political culture and psychology of getting ongoing consent. Put simply, 
The idea of being ruled by the other side has become increasingly intolerable to voters who are at all strongly partisan. Campaigns in recent national elections reinforce this. The message that produced voter turnout in 2020 that was higher than in any election since 1900 were all about saving the country from the other candidate. I adverted to that earlier. The messaging worked, people believed it, and they came out to vote <clears throat> to save the country from the other people who were also coming out to vote. These are the conditions in which denying that you really lost becomes more appealing because losing feels so existential and intolerable. We see, I think, that most egregiously in Republican election denial. <clears throat> but I think that even before 2020, it had its Democratic version in the wish to chalk up Trump's 2016 win to Russian interference. And regardless, this, um, <clears throat> these pressures, which is my analytic point, focus attention on the majority thwarting features of our system, which would be there as a matter of fact, even if everyone were scrupulously truthful and empirical. So far as we have, and excuse me, <clears throat> and so far, we have avoided the most volatile possibilities that are built into this disjunction. Imagine the continuing storm if Trump had won the popular vote by five or six million, but somehow lost the Electoral College. Imagine, for that matter, the Democratic fervor to deny Trump's legitimacy if he had pulled out the Electoral College in 2020, despite Biden's seven million vote majority. And that counterfactual, we might well be down the road to broader kinds of constitutional crisis, such as states openly nullifying federal policy on, say, immigration or abortion. <clears throat> what I've been pointing out is that intrinsic vulnerabilities or ambiguities in the way we do democracy have come under significant pressure in recent years, partly because the conditions in which our politics happens have changed. It may be helpful <clears throat> to pull back a little and take a broader look at those conditions then. In a wonderful book called The Principles of Representative Government, Bernard Manin argued that modern democracy had moved through three very different eras in which the system was anchored by different institutions and different social realities that provided effective answers to the question, how does a democracy pose questions for itself and how does it produce legitimacy for the ways, uh, for the answers that it gives? <clears throat> In the 18th century's version of parliamentarism, it's antique, but I'll pass over it quickly. Think of the Britain of Edmund Burke, if that name is familiar to some of you. And well into the 19th century, the representatives who could claim to act on behalf of the people were part of a relatively coherent, wealthy, homogenous elite bound by education, marriage, and interest who confidently asserted that they acted on behalf of the nation. This was the sort of government the American framers largely thought they were creating, although it was never very stable here. <clears throat> Over the course of the 19th century and into the 20th, mass enfranchisement knocked out this class monopoly and brought waves of new men, new kinds of people into politics, buoyed by a much broader electorate. What stabilized this early mass democracy was the rise of the political party as a means of giving a vision and purpose to the results of tens of millions of scattered and distracted decisions. <clears throat> Voters might be a sovereign that could only say yes or no, him or her, because that's all a ballot can present to you. But parties could promise and plan and act based on visions of what the country's conflicts and needs were and in saying yes to one such vision and no to another, voters could actually say quite a lot. Writing in the, in the 1990s, Menin, whose book I'm drawing on, thought the US had passed from party democracy to what he called media democracy, in which party discipline had receded and what guided popular judgment was the way mass media framed the charisma of certain candidates and narrated the country's situation overall. Ronald Reagan's film star commandeering of US politics in the 1980s was the paradigm. He presented that decade as a movie in which the US was the heroic protagonist. And in doing so, he confounded lines of party loyalty and brought much of elite as well as popular sentiment with him. There's no doubt that the power of broadcast media in those decades was immense. Let me just give you one example, because I think, although it's a little esoteric at this point, it is an interesting contrast with the last decade. 
There was a populist anti-globalization businessman who ran for president in 1992 called Ross Perot. For a while, he was looking like a contender against both Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. Respectable media held him up as someone interesting, someone worth hearing. Certainly, he sold copy and he drew viewers. I vividly remember, it was the very beginning of my political awareness, <clears throat> when the narrative changed and the stories on him became like those on Trump in the New York Times in 2016. He was erratic. He was probably a fabulist. He was maybe in the grip of conspiracy theories. He was definitely lacking the judgment for the presidency. And his candidacy faded. The difference between 1992 and 2016 is that with no social media and no Fox News, the central institutions of media democracy kept their hands on the steering wheel, controlled the narrative. Today, our media is so, are so fragmented that there's no such thing as a narrative steering wheel. N at the risk of being unfair to, I think it's a Utah paper. I'm sorry if I'm wrong about that. <clears throat> um, not a single major newspaper endorsed Donald Trump in 2016. And the legacy media coverage was largely of the, oh, I can't look away um, variety. But the narrative was, was in other hands. <clears throat> and a certain kind of insurrectionary candidacy was po possible in a way that would have been probably quashed by <clears throat> old style media democracy. Now, I don't mean to be nostalgic for the gatekeeping role of traditional media. I mean to be analytic. In media democracy, the semi-official public narratives of the mainstream media played an important role in posing the questions for political decision and in cultivating the stability and effective legitimacy of the result. The radical, Linguist and agitator Noam Chomsky and others famously called this process manufacturing consent. He took the term from Walter Lippmann, who meant it more positively. It sounds dubious, sounds like manipulation. But if a political system needs consent to work and its manufacturing breaks down, we might well ask how else we're going to get it. In recent decades, intensifying in the last seven years, the discipline of the political parties looking back to Manet's previous era, party democracy, has also grown weaker and more diffuse, even as the media have turned to cultivating divergent and incompatible narratives, clashing ideas about what the country's problems are and what needs to happen, and critically about whether the decisions emerging from our political system are even legitimate. All of this <clears throat> greatly intensifies pressure on the weak points or the ambiguous points in our political institutions the gaps between majority votes or opinion and control of government, the ambiguities about local and national power. Where does this leave us? <clears throat> I think it leaves us somewhere really <clears throat> interesting and difficult. We're facing an intensified version of the democratic problem. We might even say we're facing a purified version of it. Political cynics have often said that democracy, stripped of mystification, is a process by which one part of the political community, the majority, exercises power over another part, the minority. In this light, it's just another form of authoritarianism, one in which the dictator is, the <clears throat> is a subset of the public. And in some sense, this is right. We shouldn't run away from it entirely or try to get away from it by nicing it up. It's frightening. <clears throat> because any political power over us is frightening. But political power clearly understood is necessary. We need answers to questions like what we will do about climate change and habitat preservation, how we'll be taxed and policed, whether abortion is legal, what happens at our borders. You can wholesale dislike or want to reject the kinds of answers we give to these questions but no one can cogently deny that they will get answers of some kind. And democracy comes closest to the idea that the answers should come from the people who will live with them, from us. It makes us one another's rulers, as I said before. I repeat it because I want to emphasize it. On questions where, because there has to be an answer, and the answer has to come from somewhere, there will be a ruler. And the fundamental question is who or where that will be. 
So can we stand to be ruled by one another? And if not, what are our alternatives? That's what I mean to point to with the title, the Futures, Possible Futures of American Democracy. So here are a few alternatives. One is that we hand over more and more decisions to independent expert authorities. For example, to try to kind of state the appeal of this, some of the most important and creative political acts of the last two decades have been in the ways that the Federal Reserve and other central banks responded to the financial crises of 2008-9 and of 2020 following the COVID-19 outbreak. In both cases, public bankers improvised rather extraordinary measures and set the pace and tone of policy. They made policies that had big side effects, like the distributional effects of massive asset inflation, <clears throat> and quite possibly produced long-term systemic destabilization whose results we haven't yet seen. Some people think we might see premonitions of it in the FTX collapse. <clears throat> they also likely saved the world from two deep crises. The power to rule belongs in part to whoever can use it, especially whoever can use it to keep the world from falling apart. Not surprisingly, influential commentators have argued since that central banks should also lead the way on climate change by underwriting an energy transition because they seem to be able to do things and others seem not to be able to do things. In other words, the success of this nominally non-political expert policymaking has seemed to be a paradigm for policymaking more generally and a kind of substitute for <clears throat> the mess and messiness of politics, of more familiar politics. Another alternative, another possible future, is that one side builds up effective majorities large enough that it doesn't really have to deal with the other. This is the occasional fantasy of political strategists, and it's much more often the nightmare that each side has about the other. For liberals, Republicans are going to do it through voter suppression, though I think they still overlook how much more our constitutional distortions do to weaken majority rule than any voting regulation passed so far. For conservatives, Democrats are going to do it through demographic change or through making Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico into states. I don't mean to say that these would be equivalent things to do or that they're equivalent forecasts, but I do mean to make the point that this image of a permanent majority haunts us. And I want to say that no party or movement is likely to achieve a towering or permanent majority. I think it's more accurate to say that we now have two minority parties in the country with neither one able to achieve national popular support and stable control of government and that the various efforts to tweak institutions in one direction or another are marks of desperation more than they are indications of total victory around the corner for anyone. So I think that second possibility is not now very likely. The third alternative, a more likely one, is really no alternative. It's more of the same. We remain intolerable to one another in our political lives. <clears throat> we get less done in politics than we need to do. We lurch from crisis to crisis, but most of our crises are expressions of political weakness, cries of frustration that reaffirm our dysfunction. The latest premonitions of this are very fresh in our minds right now, if you've been reading the headlines. The House can't elect a speaker. The country can't handle its debt without periodic crises. Maybe, maybe, forecasting, speculating in the next decade, the defeated president has to be escorted out of the White House and there's scattered violence and lots of anger. Maybe Washington can't get Texas or California to follow its immigration policy. Maybe governors will run on the promise to nullify Supreme Court decisions. This direction is already much too recognizable. Political dysfunction becomes our new normal. So let's ask into a fourth alternative. Could we make democracy more real and effective? Now, in thinking about this question, <clears throat> I'm going to try to avoid some ways of speaking that come to mind very readily. I'm going to try to avoid talking about renewing democracy or about overcoming an erosion of democracy, ways of thinking about where we sort of are in history that I think are rhetorically attractive but not quite right. The US has been a democracy in a fairly minimal sense, universal enfranchisement, only since the full enforcement of the 1965 Voting Rights Act ended explicit racial disenfranchisement. And that's, um, that's going on 60 years. It's getting to be a long time, but it's still considerably shorter than an average lifespan. 
Other kinds of explicit disenfranchisement persist. The 5 million citizens who were ineligible to vote in 2020 because of a current or former felony conviction were more than the number who voted in the presidential election in 41 states. 12 million legal non-citizen residents can't vote, nor can another 10 to 12 million unauthorized migrants, many of whom make their lives here, pay taxes, depend on schools to help raise their children, or otherwise deep inside the systems that democracy is meant to keep accountable. My opinion, which is not standard, but I think it's defensible enough that I just want to put it before you, is that one doesn't have to have any particular view about, say, prisons or borders in order to believe that the basic democratic principle is that the people who make their lives in a place and live with its laws should be the ones who approve its laws. I think it matters a great deal for the state of our democracy that those who live here but can't vote make up a population larger than any states except Texas or California. So, for me, there tend to be two questions bound up together, and this is why I pause over these, um, to my mind, continuing limitations in our, in our democratic commitment. The, the two questions are, first, how can we save or renew democracy? And second, how can we make democracy more real or achieve it? In a sense, these two questions can have a paradoxical relationship because saving democracy often means keeping up, shoring up the powerful but limited system that we have, and making it real may mean trying to disrupt and change that system in ways that would make us cry foul if the other side did it for other goals, whichever side we're on. Um, <clears throat> we just have to keep this difficulty in mind <clears throat> and remember that at the same time, we're always, all of us, on the one hand, speaking from our own ideas of democracy and also seeking a next version of our democratic institutions that we can agree to disagree around, the basis of our next productive fight. To borrow an old image, a democracy is always rebuilding its ship while it's at sea, and I'll add, at the same time, arguing over the destination and even arguing over the design of the ship, which is not easy. So there's no simple formula for thinking about the direction that aims to deepen, renew, achieve and save democracy, but, he, but here's a direction. To make democracy work and work better, how we live should reinforce and not undercut the belief that we're fundamentally equals who can make decisions together with our fellow citizens, taking turns ruling and being ruled. <clears throat> the ways we live should present us to one another as political equals who can be trusted with shared power. <clears throat> I want to sketch what this might mean in three domains, the economy, constitutional law, and cultural life. <clears throat> I'll say the least about the economy. The idea that to be co-rulers, democratic citizens need to have a certain amount of independence, a place to stand without fear or domination, that idea is very old, and it cuts across ideological lines. In most times and places, <clears throat> it's been resolved by a trick in which people who don't have real economic standing are also denied real citizenship, explicitly or implicitly. If we believe in universal citizenship, I think the question has to be what it means for economic membership to be universal also. I believe we have to consider the possibility that our economy can undercut our democracy by leaving behind or grinding down whole populations in whole regions of the country where people have reason to doubt that they really are economic citizens, by producing both mega wealthy classes that can imagine they don't need the rest of us, and professionals like many of us are or will become who can afford to cloister in our own cities and neighborhoods. And then I'm trying to moralize about myself here. This is a story that is intended to include me and not be finger pointing about all the other <clears throat> bad people. Um, by taking over, talking about what the economy can do to politics, still by taking over big tracts of public debate, think of Twitter, but not only of Twitter, for a profit model that holds people's attention because attention is valuable for selling people things, by stoking fear and resentment and self-righteousness. The economy can undercut our politics by creating financial crises like the 2008 to nine collapse that make people feel that their world is out of control a feeling that's never good for politics because it presents us to ourselves as both desperate and powerless. 
In short, the ideas that I started by talking about, ideas about how the world was going in the decades before 2016, that we could let the market take care of itself, and that market life and democratic life went hand in hand, so that letting the market take care of itself would help democracy to take care of itself. Those ideas were lazy. They made things seem easy that were and remain hard. Because this question, what would a more democracy supporting economy look like as a lecture in itself or a series of lectures, I'll leave it here. Part of the reason to want democracy to work is that the economy does not take care of itself and we need other ways, political ways, to take responsibility for the world that we make together. Now I'll say a little more about my second topic, constitutional law. This is a tricky area, partly because the Constitution is both the source of some of our strongest and most questionable anti-majoritarian political practices, and it's also, in our political culture, the symbol of our ability to live together under a shared set of rules. In American political culture, the Constitution is what I called earlier the shared ground on which we agree to disagree. <clears throat> It's both a problem and a resource. I talked earlier about the structural divergences between constitutional rule and majority rule under our constitution and how they've come under pressure in our current polarization. And to put my own cards on the table, I think this pressure is appropriate from a democratic perspective, even if the factors that drive it aren't always desirable. I think Majority rule is the best institutional proxy for democratic consent, and that the dangers of minority rule are generally worse than those of majority rule. Having said that, what would a democratic relation to the Constitution look like? To my mind, it would first move toward a constitutional structure that better translated majority votes into governing majorities. I think it's better for democracy when elections have consequences for policy and policy has consequences for elections and people know exactly how their votes count. Now having said that, I think the most fundamental and interesting aspect of a democratic relation to the Constitution would focus on the document itself, on the content and sources of our fundamental law. <clears throat> Above all, it would give living generations the power to amend or affirm our fundamental law, so that at the opening line, we the people, would refer to those of us who live with the Constitution today, and not only to those who ratified it. Imagine an agreement that every 27 years, once in a generation, we would hold a constitutional convention. It would be structured to be both representative and deliberative, to include representatives of the elected political establishment, but also citizens from outside it, and the convention's charge would be to consider the current constitution and propose any amendments that its members thought desirable. Those would then be voted up or down in a national referendum, which would be the only act in American politics of the people in their collective capacity, to echo that line of Madison's about who's excluded. <clears throat> Is there a constitutional right to choose abortion or spend money in politics, to race blind college admissions, or should those questions be left to Congress or state legislatures? Living national majorities should be able to answer those questions. I don't mean that the question should necessarily be left up to legislatures, but that the question of what is entrenched in the Constitution should itself be a special kind of democratic decision. In the picture I'm offering you, the generational decisions about some of these questions would provide a tempo to American politics a second tempo behind and alongside that of elections. This tempo would remind us that we're each part of a system of popular sovereignty, and each generation would substantially live with a fundamental law that it had approved, even if that had meant changing nothing, looking into the Constitution and saying everything's fine here. When you come down to it, I believe there's no better way for the Constitution to be our Constitution rather than the preferred interpretation of a majority of Supreme Court justices or the set of structural rules that seemed best for very different people and probably for very different reasons in 1789. I'll just pose this question. If you, and I pose this to myself as well, it's a real question. If your first response is that this is a dangerous, wild idea, 
it's worth at least asking, why should the power to make fundamental law not belong to the living people who live with it? Is it really a power that can only exist in the distant past or in the aftermath of revolutions? Or is it something that we're capable of, if only we could trust ourselves and trust one another enough to do it? For this question, or any other ambitious prospect of saving or achieving American democracy, that last phrase, whether we can trust one another, is key. So I will last say something about culture. <clears throat> when Donald Trump came to power, liberals rallied to what they called norms, the habits and implicit practice of political institutions that provided the guardrails of democracy, to use a common phrase, by setting certain power moves off limits, extreme partisan maneuvering over Supreme Court seats, for example, or lying about election results. <clears throat> Americans learned to think of democracy as norms, as a web of constitutional practices, not just after 2016, but also, um, at least in part, through the Cold War revival of Alexis de Tocqueville's classic work, Democracy in America. Tocqueville insisted, and set a whole train of thought in motion, in insisting that rule by the people was not literally possible. Majorities couldn't think together or share intentions. But if people largely agreed already and any way, on the major issues, they could feel like they were ruling themselves. And that, a sort of implicit pre-existing cultural consensus, and for Tocqueville it was very much a racial consensus as well, he was quite explicit about that, it was what white Americans thought, the Anglo-Americans as he put it. Um, that kind of bodying, bodying itself forth into politics was what democracy was. In the past I've sometimes criticized the focus on norms for elevating tradition over the democratic capacity for change, and in part for its roots in a certain kind of complacent, whatever we're doing must be enough, whatever its problems are, that I think is glimpsed even in the origin in Tocqueville's kind of confident, unreflective racism about American norms and American democracy. So as I say, I have been, as some of you, anyone who reads my stuff knows, critical of the norms focus. But today, let me say a word in, in favor of political norms, um, or to use an older term, political virtue. When we talk about how to, use, how to do democracy, we're always starting an argument and potentially a fight over power. And there's no productive fight over power that we can have without also sharing some civic solidarity, some affection even, some sense of common purpose. And the public argument that shapes democratic decisions is also hard to imagine without some other virtues or shared norms. A commitment to truth, enough that standards of evidence are in common or overlapping, that lies are discrediting, that votes settle elections. The basic political virtue is the commitment to your practice of self-government continuing, fairly healthy and resilient, even when it does not give you what you want, even when it means your power fades and someone else's rises. It is political nihilism to say that you would rather see the system burn than see yourself lose. Citizenship requires, sometimes above all, the courage and integrity to lose. <clears throat> How are we doing on this front? Adam Smith remarked in his theory of moral sentiments, <clears throat> that we care less about whether other people share our affections than we do about whether they share our resentments. I think about that phrase a lot. I think it's not necessarily true, but it can certainly become true. And we've been working hard on it. Past the point, this is how we become intolerable to one another as co-rulers. And so democracy itself becomes intolerable. And that spirit forecloses a more democratic future. So in culture, we need to find ways to see one another, not just as enemies or threats, but also as potential collaborators. There's nothing easy about this. Trust is easier to tear down than to build. The real contribution of democratic politics to common culture has often been that it has built worlds in which people have lived and acted together. In past generations, those have included unions under the National Labor Relations Act, the great public universities, the peacetime draft, 
and the simple experience of living among people who could cogently act to solve their problems through politics. Like when Congress responded to the environmental crisis of the late 1960s by passing the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act over four years, mostly by large majorities. It's amazing to look back at that period and see people saying, the world is ending, but you know what, we can do something about it. And then they went and they did something about it. Contrary to what you hear, culture is not always upstream of politics. Good politics, dynamic politics can help to build democratic culture. And the greatest challenge on all of these fronts is how to get from our vexed and fragmented here to a more democratic there. Giving democratic majorities more chance to rule ourselves would touch on some of the greatest fears of both left and right. As the Republican Party has come to rely existentially on a minority rule strategy, right-wing candidates have portrayed simple democracy as opposed to a republic as an un-American menace that would put the wrong people in charge or threaten fundamental liberties. By the same token, the Trumpist takeover of the Republican Party has reinforced many Democrats' suspicion that bigoted and violent masses are just lurking out there in the hinterlands and need to be held back by strong institutional barriers. These are just specific versions of how we become intolerable to one another, make one another intolerable to ourselves as potential rulers. <clears throat> Basic political change takes mobilization strong enough to shift the pillars of power and also civic trust deep enough that people will accept the results of the change. If we don't have both mobilization and trust, efforts at basic change will either fail to get off the ground or fail to make the results stick. Our dilemma is that with political cultures so divided, mobilization tends to deepen polarization and mistrust. Witness the 2020 elections. It's possible for all these reasons that Americans can't deepen and reinvigorate our democracy, that we're incapable of putting democracy first. That would be bleak news. A deepened democracy requires everyone to find ways of accepting their fellow citizens as their co-rulers, to accept that we have to live with losing and with losing to one another. It's only if we have that willingness that we can also win a future that we've chosen together. And that is the point. Not to make the system work just because it's the one we were born into. Not to insist that people live up to some abstract concept of democracy because it's the right concept. But to ask whether we believe we should live as political equals because we're also moral equals. And whether we believe that we should choose our future together because any other path would be a form of fate imposed on us willy-nilly, unfree, and almost certainly unfair. I think we would like to mean those things, and that to mean them, we also have to make them real, and that that is our challenge. So thank you very much, um, and now let's talk. Uh, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've been collecting some questions for you. I, 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 we're likely not going to be able to get to all of them, but just a, a, off the top, um, you indicated that uh, elections are a crude way of channeling the collective voice of the people. What would you suggest is a less crude way of maintaining this important part of our democracy? For example, ranked choice voting, removal of the electoral college. I think another uh, person asked about sortition, the old Athenian method of randomly selecting jurors. Right. So I think the crudeness is inevitable to some extent. Um, I didn't mean to talk it down, just to say that it's, that it's the tool we have to work with. Um, why I spoke about parties and media culture is that so much of the question really has to be how the questions that voters decide on get formulated and put in front of them, because the, the, the vote is... Um, is always going to tend to be either a simple binary or a sort of complicated binary. I mean, ranked choice voting does arguably help. I think the case for it is, is good, but it's just it's a kind of multi-stage complicated <laughs> binary. This person or the, or the other person is, is ultimately what it comes down to. Um, uh, a lot of people like the idea, political theorists like the idea called sortition of lotterying citizens into 
uh, deliberative and maybe decision-making councils. The idea is this is, is more representative, jury-style decision-making than elections. Um, it's a long discussion. I actually suggest in the book that random jury-style selection of some of the representatives of one of my hypothetical constitutional conventions, an idea that I put out not because I think it's going to happen next year, but because I think it's good to try to think about what we, would, what we might do if we really meant what we say and to try to seed the political imagination, that it might be good to, to have um, a number of people in those conventions who are there just because they're citizens, not because they were already special, not because they were already famous or wealthy or politically connected. But fundamentally, I think that um, random selection of decision makers doesn't substitute for voting. I think voting is special. I think um, a certain kind of political science cynicism that says voting doesn't really do anything, doesn't make anything happen, most voting doesn't matter, voting is irrational. I think that's wrong. I think there are actually good arguments against it. I think voting does make something happen. I think there are good reasons to vote. Um, and whether or not you agree with that, I think the political ferment and transformation and change in people's idea and ideas and even identities that happen in the run-up to mass elections are tre a tremendously important part of politics. And no technical substitute, like getting a jury-style assembly that's a snapshot of where politics is before such a campaign, can substitute for what the campaign itself can do to politics. So I'm all for voting, actually, even with its crudeness. Um, I just mean to say in a way that I think we need to look down the barrel of how limited and blunt our democratic processes are and find ways to, I think, to, to embrace them and live with them and try to get better decisions out of them. Yeah, uh, time for just a few more. Yeah, of course. I'll try to be more succinct. No, 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 not at all. Um, uh, so uh, one person asks, um, how can we say there's equal value in each voter? Maybe helping uh, have confidence in, in our you know, the opposing political parties when gerrymandering and other vote blocking efforts are still largely employed without, without any restraint or check. Um, no, we can't. I mean, I, I, I think we can't. Um, I, so I meant to say that we are more aware and quite appropriately of these structural distortions because we quite rightly um, have a stronger sense that the vote ought to have equal value in principle than used to be the case even among people who confident, confidently talked about themselves as, as Democrats. So no, I don't, I don't think we can, and I think we should all be pushing against gerrymandering, which I didn't talk about so much, as well as the other kinds of democratic distortion that I'm talking about. So in fact, the question is exactly right. Um, and you should keep answering, keep asking that question. Well, uh, last one. Uh, in his book, uh, What is Populism? Jan Werner claims that populists never admit losing elections. They always claim that the real people uh, voted for them and that the rest are not part of we the people. Um, is there no form of democratic populism? Oh, so that, this is an interesting question. So what... Um, I'm sorry, this is a little, I want to not give an insidery answer. So um, a lot of people have talked about populism as a sort of pathology of modern politics, and they mean a lot of different things by it. And some people say, oh, any politics that's angry is, is populist. Any politics that opposes um, existing constitutions and high courts is populist. Um, any us and them politics is populist, and, pol and populism is bad. Always bad because it's fundamentally destructive and leads to authoritarianism. Jan Mueller's book is really, it's very specific, but I'll be fast, is really good in that it says, no, that's not right. So David Brooks of the New York Times said, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are the populist of the left and the populist of the right because they're both angry. Um, and Mueller said, no, that's not, that's not right. Politics has to include lots of room for anger, for oppositional formulations, for criticism of and even attack on existing institutions. What it has to be constrained by to be democratic is the continuing commitment to the idea that we are all in the political community and we're all going to continue to be in the political community after this fight. What is a bad and dangerous thing worth calling populism is the form of politics that refuses to admit it's lost because it always claims to be acting on behalf of the only true 
people and therefore saying that some of the people are not really the people at all. That's really bad. The rest of the stuff that we sometimes call populism, a lot of that is actually politics that we need and we wouldn't have the politics we have today and it's better qualities if we hadn't had it before. Well, with that uh, observation, I'm afraid that we've run out of time and there are so many questions that we weren't yeah. able to get to. We apologize for that. But I apologize for no, that. No, no, no. no that's I actually, a, that's on me. There, 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 is, there is lunch afterward. <laughs> I think people can, can come and shout at me. Well, um, instead of shouting, I would encourage you all to join me in thanking Professor Purdy for- Thank you. Thank you. It's really, really, thank you. It's great to be out here with you.